the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the Church, which will not endure sound doctrine, having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training, and many have imbibed new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Vincent Peale and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the apostate church of the book of Revelation. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This one's called a Vatican Below the Surface and deals with chapter 10 of the book I'm currently reading and discussing, All Roads Lead to Rome, the ecumenical movement by Michael de Semlian. You know how the Holy Spirit moves sometimes, yeah? Today we have the 2nd of October. Yesterday, on the 1st of October, a Sabbath, I recorded the same reading that I'm doing now in English in German, because you know I read this, I read this book simultaneously, chapter by chapter, in German and English. And before I started the German reading, I was very anxious to start the German reading, because I received yesterday a video from the Forerunner 777, or the Forerunner Chronicles. A YouTube channel that probably a lot of my subscribers also know. And uh, here and there he often he, he brings out a video that is quite interesting and even dealing with actual and current events. So in this video, the Pope's silent war, he warns about a meeting about uh, <laughs> it starts, of course, with a little bit of Tony Palmer in there, you know, when he was at the meeting with Kenneth Copeland, saying the protest is over, and if there's no protest anymore, how can there be a Protestant church? This apostasy video that he did just before he died. And so this video deals a little bit about a meeting that is going to happen with Pope Francis um, when he is uh, going to Sweden at the um, in October this year in a so-called attempt to destroy the history of the Protestant Reformation. And um, you can look that up when you go to the Forerunners channel, uh, the Forerunner 777, you will see what's it all about. But of course, the 31st of October this year is Reformation Day, 499 years anniversary before we go into 2017 and have the 500th anniversary of the Reformation started. So... <coughs> I was preparing chapter 10 and reading that and I was watching this video and uh, all of a sudden I saw that this is something very interesting to integrate into that reading because he deals with a paper that um, is called From Conflict to Communion, <coughs> a ecumenical paper that is already out since I think 2013 and I have it as well as, as, well as in German as in English on my computer. And I flew a little bit over it, but um, it is full of casuistry and sophistry and Pope speech and for 100 pages doing that, uh, I, I just didn't feel to do that. 
So I left it alone, but now uh, the forerunner mentioned that in his video, The Pope's Silent War, and by the way, the um, the link to the video from the forerunner as well as to the document from conflict to communion is uh, is to be found in the description box of this video. So now when we start reading chapter 10, Vatican below the first surface, it starts with dialogue, political and ecumenical, is taking place continuously all over the world. There is that uneasy feeling that in terms of real power exercised, we see but the tip of the iceberg. Glimpses of what might be lurking underneath come to the surface from time to time. And here, of course, then I have to go into that paper that was mentioned by the forerunner in his video, The Pope's Silent War, dealing with the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Because this paper, From Conflict to Communion, is, as I said already, an ecumenical paper. And I just thought, that that was be that was very fitting as a comment in doing this reading here so when we go into that paper on page 15 on the pdf in english it's 100 pages in german it's 106 on page 15 in the english version we come to uh, point 11 that is under the commemoration in a new global and secular context yeah? Um, we come to point 11 that they make here, and um, that partially reads as follows, quote, In lands where Christianity has already been at home for many centuries, many people have left the churches in recent times, or have forgotten their ecclesial traditions. As a result of this forgetting, much of what divided the church in the past is virtually unknown today." Unquote. And I find this a very, very important little thing to read, especially since I'm reading now the book All Roads Lead to Rome, dealing with the ecumenical movement, and even exposing the ecumenical movement for what it actually is, meaning that Protestants go back under the wings of Rome. And when you read here in the ecumenical paper and lands where Christianity has already been at home for many centuries, many people have left the churches in recent times or have forgotten their ecclesial traditions. Why did they forget their ecclesial traditions? Well, because what is taught today is not the same what is taught years ago. And maybe even some people have woken up to the deception the Roman Catholic Church plays. But as a result of this forgetting, the article conduces much of what divided the church in the past is virtually unknown today. Well, and that is a very important point. Much what divided the church in the past is virtually unknown today. That is because the difference between real Protestantism and Roman Catholicism is not taught anymore because all the pastors are teaching futurism. They teach a future Antichrist. They teach the lie of the Jesuits founded by Francisco Ribera in 1590 or put out for the first time in 1590 that futurist deception is much older than that. It used to be taught within the Roman Catholic Church also when priests fell apostate because after reading the Bible they recognized the Pope as being the Antichrist. But the point being, it was put out there in 1590 and the whole 18th and 19th century United States of America, first and for all, and the rest of the world also, was just indoctrinated with this teaching of a future Antichrist. As a result of this forgetting, much of what divided the church in the past is virtually unknown today. So when we do not know anymore what was the uh, what divided the church in the beginning and with the church i mean the protestant denominations on the one hand and the roman catholic church on the other hand when we don't know what divided them anymore then why is there division well then we can do like tony palmer said forget the protest and come back under the wings of rome we have to remember what divided the church in the past yeah but the most important point that I read was actually in chapter 2. That was on page 18 of the document. New perspectives on Martin Luther and the Reformation, point number 16. And this is really, blow, this will blow your mind. The casuistry and sophistry in this little sentence here is the one that I thought, that is why I have to read this to you uh, while reading All Roads Lead to Rome here. 
Quote, what happened in the past cannot be changed, but what is remembered of the past and how it is remembered can, with the passage of time, indeed change. Remembrance makes the past present. While the past itself is unalterable, the presence of the past in the present is alterable. In view of 2017, 500 years reformation, the point is not to tell a different story, but to tell that story differently. Unquote. So I hope that you understood this casistry and sophistry in this paper. What happened in the past cannot be changed, but what is remembered of the past and how it is remembered can be changed. Yeah, because you change the teaching of history. With the passage of time, indeed, can change. Yeah, remembrance makes the past present. Right, but how can we remember the past that we did never experience? So we have to learn about that past. Therefore, we turn to our teachers and our priests, to schools, to books, to magazines, newspapers, television, like Hitlery channel or history channel or whatever to try to learn that stuff but when they alter the history that is taught in there we have a wrong picture of the past while the past itself is unalterable well depends on the teaching that you teach of course the presence of the past in the present is alterable <laughs> that is fine sophistry right now, in view of 2017, the point is not to tell a different story, but to tell that story differently. I think that when you tell some fairy tales differently, you can also make the wolf the good and um, the little girl the bad person. It depends on how you tell it. So you won't even tell a different story, but you just tell it differently. And that is what the Roman Catholic Church is all about. So, this paper from Conflict to Communion, I advise everybody to read, but be aware of the Jesuitical casuistry and sophistry in that paper. Because it's full of it and you are easily caught in a trap, in a lie from that. But now I will continue reading chapter 10 of All Roads Lead to Rome, Vatican Below the Surface, and we are dealing now uh, still with the second uh, the second paragraph because I just read to you the very first paragraph because glimpses of what might be lurking underneath come to the surface from time to time and this was something that was lurking under the surface. According to The Economist in December 1988 quote, the Catholic Church was prominently involved in the struggle that toppled the dictatorship of President Fernand, Fernand, uh, Ferdinand Marcos unquote as we can read in The Economist from the 24th of December 1988. The Evening Standard, referring to the 1986 gathering of world ecumenical leaders at Assisi, recorded that, quote, guerrilla groups and militias in at least 10 different countries agreed to honor the Pope's 24 hours of peace, unquote. The Evening Standard writes this on the 27th of October 1986. This extraordinary exercise of power over peace seems to anticipate the fulfillment of the Marian prophecy from Fatima, which is the central vision for Pope John Paul's II pontificate. He believes that there will be a reappearance of the Virgin Mary with great signs and wonders to convince the world of papal spiritual leadership as a precursor to a period of peace. Many would agree that this is just what is predicted in the scriptures. The next part in this chapter is called Opus Dei. And who does not know what or who Opus Dei is, I advise you to check many writings on the Jesuit order where you can see that Opus Dei is a very extreme sect within the secret organization of the Jesuits and you will learn even more than that little bit that is written in the book here. But this is already 
telling you the direction this goes. Another glimpse of power rarely visible relates to the relatively new right-wing organization Opus Dei, with which Roberto Calvi had dealings. You remember Roberto Calvi, right? The dead banker that we were talking about in earlier chapters. Described by Italian politicians as a holy mafia, this secretive organization operates as a kind of spiritual militant tendency. Pope John Paul II seems to have taken it under his wing, and in 1982 he made it a personal prelature. The organization reports direct unto the Vatican, to the Pope's prelate, Monsignor Alcaro del Portillo. This we can read in the Daily Telegraph on the 8th of May, 1986. So the author of the article in the Daily Telegraph here says Pope John Paul II seems to have taken it under his wing. Well, if anything, then it is the other way around, because as we know that the Jesuits control the White Pope, uh, an organization as Opus Dei, which is an extreme right-wing organization within the secret society of the Jesuits, will surely not be under the guidance of the Pope, but the other way around. Eh? The prelature was an unprecedented step taken by the Polish Pope, giving him control personally of an organization outside the whole diocesan structure of the Church and independent of its orders. It may be that Pope John Paul II took the step in an attempt to counterbalance the formidable and growing power of the Jesuits. Well, I have to disagree with this, because Opus Dei is a order within the order of the Jesuits, and by there it is submissive to the Black Pope, as is John Paul II, as is the White Pope. So, this is just a distraction, maybe, to even some people within the hierarchy, but the real power structure does not change. And we will come to the real power structure in a few moments. Monsignor del Portillo was nominated Bishop for Life by the Pope in December 1990 and made immune from the canon law ruling requi a rule requiring his resignation at the age of 75. Also, in December 1990, the State of Italy published a decree of quote-unquote official recognition of the organization as a moral public entity. Yeah, we are talking here about Opus Dei. The timing of the declaration was described on both sides of the Tiber as coincidental. Yeah, my eye and came five years after the Italian Parliament opened an inquiry into Opus Dei. Coincidental. As if there was anything ever coincidental concerning the Jesuit order. An offshoot of the Jesuits, founded in 1928, Opus Dei has been described as a quasi-diocese, covering the entire world and not defined by territory. It claims a membership of 75,000 in 80 countries and 1,400 priests, as we can read in the Catholic magazine The Universe from the 16th of December 1990. Articles have appeared in the press expressing the deep concern of parents whose sons have been recruited by Opus Dei and entirely lost to their families apparently becoming entirely different personalities. Yes, apparently becoming entirely different personalities. That is because that this secret society called Opus Dei, which is part of the Jesuit order, uses of course the same training devices as the Jesuit order does. And there too, as you probably know, belong the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. And spiritual exercises is actually just a fancy word for brainwashing. It's nothing else than that. And it will totally change your personality. Yep, you know, when you know the oaths of the Jesuits, then you know that they are acting perende ac cadaver, means they act like they have no meaning, no opinion, 
no um, conscience of their own. They give that entirely up to the society of Jesus and their superiors. So of course this changes people when they go into educate into being recruited by Opus Dei, uh, as the parents say here, and apparently becoming entirely different personalities. Of course the old person dies and the new person that is born doesn't resemble in any way the person that you've known before. And this is not only for Opus Dei the case, this is also for Jesuits the case. But of course, most and for all Jesuits are chosen because they don't have any family or anything. They are living alone and nobody notices the changes anyway. The degree of secrecy that is involved comes across as sinister. That's the least you can say about that. An excerpt from Sydney Morning Herald feature on this powerful and highly favored organization helps us to see why this is so. Quote, Numenaries are expected not only to take three monastic vows of chastity and obedience. This includes one session of self-flagellation a week, with a variation with that cat o' nine tails and the wearing of two hours a day of the psyllis, a metal chain with links turned inward, held in place by a thong. This is worn about the upper thigh, so that it so that it and the injuries it causes are not seen. The minimum recruiting age is fourteen and a half. The founder, Monsignor Escriva, said he received all this huh? how to find how to found this organization. He received all this direct from God by a vision. Well, let me ask you something as a Bible-believing Christian. What God is that who tells you to self-flagellate you at least once a week with a variation of the cat o' nine tails and wearing two hours a day the psyllis, which is a metal chain with links turned inward, held in place by a thong, to wear upon the upper thigh so that it and the injuries itself cannot be seen? Do you know that two of the judges of the United States Supreme Court today are members of Opus Dei and they self-flagellate themselves like that every day? Where does God, the God of the Bible, ever ask of people to do such atrocities to themselves? We are the living temple where the Holy Spirit resides in, right? Are we to treat the temple in that way? Are we to self-flagellize and are we to injure our body and torture our body daily ourselves, which is the temple? Or are we, tr are we to treat it with respect? I don't understand people who go into secret societies like these and can be told, well, all this was told to me by God in a vision to do that. I would at that moment at least seriously start begin asking what God is that that told you this in a vision? Escriva's cause for sainthood has been advanced with unusual enthusiasm by the present Pope, John Paul II. The Spanish founder's controversial beatification in May 1992, the swiftest in modern times, has caused great concern and resentment within the Roman Catholic institution. The next part on page 116, Committed Catholics in High Places. Oh yeah. Before I even start, turn to chapter 1 of Rulers of Evil, Subliminal Rome, and read that. Then what you read here isn't of any importance anymore. But read that. Chapter 1 of Rulers of Evil, Subliminal Rome. Also dealing with committed Catholics in high places. Most and for all, of course, in the United States. But let's see what Michael de Semlian has to say on that subject. 
the rise of Roman Catholics is disproportionately high num uh, in disproportionately high numbers to positions of ascendancy and great power, which in many spheres may be dominant, is seen by concerned Protestants as another hidden factor to be reckoned with. This is a very sensitive and invidious idea uh, area, sorry, one which requires discernment and discretion and a constant guard against discrimination. Over 50% of recruits to the United States military academies are now Roman Catholic, according to 1988 figures released by the Catholic Chaplain Recruitment Vi Viker for the military services. The number of Catholics in the United States House of Representatives increased from 82 in 1950 to 142 in 1986. Catholics occupy key positions in the executive branch, the judiciary, the State Department, the delegation at the United Nations, the CIA, the FBI and the Department of Immigration. So I can't help it, but I'm going to read a little part to you from Rules of Evil, Chapter 1, Subliminal Rome. On page... Too, this is uh, Bernstein would have been wandering off point to list the Roman Catholic leaders of American domestic policy, such as Senate Major Majority Leader George Mitchell and Speaker of the House Tom Foley. In fact, when the Holy Alliance story hit the stands, there was virtually no arena of federal legislative activity. According to the 1992 World Almanac of U.S. politics, that was not direct controlled by a Roman Catholic senator or representative. The committees and subcommittees of the United States Senate and House of Representatives governing commerce, communications and telecommunications, energy, medicine, health, education and welfare, human services, consumer protection, finance and financial institutions, transportation, labor and unemployment, hazardous materials, taxation, bank regulation, currency and monetary policy, oversight of the Federal Reserve System, which is a private uh, company, as you know, comedy prizes, rents services, small business administration, urban affairs, European affairs, Near Eastern and South Asian affairs, terrorism, narcotics, international communications, international economic trade, oceans, environmental policy, insurance, housing, community development, federal loan guarantees, economic stabilization measures including wage and price controls, gold and precious metals transactions, agriculture, animal and forestry industries, rural issues, nutrition, price supports, food for peace, agricultural exports, soil conservation, irrigation, stream channelization, flood control, minority enterprise, environment and pollution, appropriations, defense, foreign operations, vaccines, drug labeling and packaging, drug and alcohol abuse, inspection and certification of fish and processed food, use of vitamins and saccharin, national health insurance proposals, human services, legal services, family relations, the arts and humanities, the handicapped and aging. In other words, virtually every aspect of secular life in America came under the chairmanship of one of those Roman Catholic laypersons. And then, then he goes on to name some names, but I'm not doing a reading of Rulers of Evil all over again. I just wanted to tell you when we go here into this that the number of Catholics in the United States House of Representatives increased from 82 in 1950 to 142 in 1986, and Catholics occupy key positions in the executive branch, the judiciary, the State Department, the delegation at the United Nations, the CIA, the FBI, and the Department of Immigration, and what all else they control through the United States Congress and the House of Representatives, what I just read to you, there is not one little place free 
in the United States of America that is not ruled by a Roman Catholic, and that's the point that I wanted to make. Immigration policy in the United States of America is sharply increasing the Roman Catholic proportion of the population, a fact made politically visible by, uh, by the fast rising importance of the Hispanic vote. And here I have to again uh, do another quote, and when you go back to Rulers of Evil you will learn that the uh, Black Pope, the General of the Society of Jesus during the 1900s, uh, Rotan and Bex, the two uh, ruled together for about 50, almost 60 years, and they at that time opened the borders of the United States of America to flood the United States of America with Roman Catholics. That's why from 1776, where you had a little bit more than 1% Catholics in that country, at the end of the 19th century you had more than 30%. Coming from 1%, that's well grown, isn't it? And here we have, of course, the importance of the Hispanic vote. The, um, why there are now... Um, as it says here, immigration policy is sharply increasing the Roman Catholic proportion of the population, uh, especially the, Hispan uh, the importance of the Hispanic vote. Well, that's the same that you have today in 2016 with the open border to Mexico, where Mexicans and people from uh, Middle and South America, called Latin America because it's Latin, it's like the Red Latin Roman Catholic Church, yeah, they are all Catholics over there and they come over to the United States of America to even infiltrate with more Catholics, not even considering by the moment that the Protestants aren't Protestants anymore because they are all ecumenical and have forgotten what to protest anyway. So how many Catholics do you have in that country? And the more Catholics you will have, the remaining Protestants will be pursued when the point, point, point hits the fan. You will see when that comes along. This is to be seen within the wider context of continuing papal prohibition of birth control throughout the Catholic world. Yeah, that's also a double standard, you know. Protestants, you should use birth control. We don't want you to grow. Roman Catholics, oh, we forbid. You don't have to use the pill. You don't have to use a condom. You don't even have to have sex if not for recreation anymore. Uh, re uh, re recreation, yeah, I mean, uh, recreate, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the word I was looking for. So you are not allowed to have sex if you don't want to have a child. That's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, something absolutely unbiblical. And of course, the prohibition of birth control throughout the Catholic world, the uh, so-called baby pill and condoms and everything, birth control is forbidden in the Catholic world because Catholics have to rise in the population. The population of the continent of South America, for example, has doubled during the last generation. What are they doing in Africa? They making Africa Catholic? And by that, of course, forbidding birth control, and by that, of course, raising more and more and more Catholics. The population of the continent of South America, for example, has doubled during the last generation. There are those who have made a study of Vatican global strategy who maintain that Vatican opposition to, global, uh, to abortion and to birth control as well as to sodomy, homosexuality, has little to do with the sanctity of human life and biblical ordinance. Of course, it has nothing to do with biblical ordinance because the Roman Catholic Church is not biblical, is not Christianity, and does not teach anything biblically. They believe that the real reason is that each new life adds to the Catholic army and contributes to the, found, to the funding of the Church. As discussed in an earlier chapter in this book already, the fact that birth control among Catholics in the major Protestant countries usually has only token opposition from the Church adds substance to this belief. In Canada it is now necessary to, de to be bilingual, to be employed in immigration and other government departments and thus a disproportionate proportionate number of recruits are Roman Catholics from Quebec and elsewhere. This bilingual policy, brought in by Pierre Elliott Trudeau, has led to most key positions in government 
and the bureaucracy, bureau, bureaucracy sorry, being held by, by bilinguals and usually Quebecois Roman Catholics. This process has been encouraged and accelerated by Catholic Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. Quebec threatened to secede if her demands were not met by the rest of the country in a new meddlesome constitution. The man placed in charge of the constitutional crisis was former Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary Roman, uh, Roman Catholic Joe Clark. The people of Canada at the October 1992 referendum decided that the Quebecois were asking too much. Leadership of the Old Dominion Commonwealth countries by serious Roman Catholics is not confined to Canada. New Zealand Prime Minister James Bolger is, de uh, is devout in his faith and presumably in his loyalty to the Supreme Pontiff. Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating is also Roman Catholic. <coughs> so, committed Catholics in high places. And again, I repeat, read chapter 1 of Rulers of Evil, Subliminal Rome. And check the sources for yourself and you will see that every word I read and commented here is the truth. Now we come to espionage and shielding of war criminals. In the book The Vatican Papers, published in 1982, Nino Lobello claims that, quote, the Vatican has the most efficient and widespread spy network in the whole world, outclassing even the Russian KGB, unquote. He states that this group of espionage agents came to be known by the popes as Sodalitium Pianum, and more widely as God's Underground, and it may include any priest, nun and monk everywhere on earth. He argues that among this faithful army of more than two and a half million people, there are many full-time trained agents. Quote, what do agents do but infiltrate other organizations? And what organizations would Catholic spies infiltrate if not other churches, especially true churches of Jesus Christ? Unquote. You want to learn more about that policy? Look up Alberto Rivera, a former Jesuit priest who was specially educated to infiltrate real Bible-believing, Christ-following churches, Protestant churches that were existent at that time, and even home churches, to destroy them. Another Catholic expert, Avro Manhattan, <coughs> who wrote a lot of wonderful, informative books on the subject of the Vatican, who died in November 1990, supports Lobello's definition, quote, it's no exaggeration to say that the Secretariat of the State of the Vatican has in every devout Catholic access to a potential source of news, and in every intelligent priest a trained informer. Whatever is judged useful from a village or parish is imparted to the local hierarchy whence it is passed to the bishop, who, in turn, takes it to the Vatican. When to this is added the sundry information collected by the numerous semi-religious institutions operating in Christian and non-Christian countries, through Catholic laymen who are organized into societies or into political parties in close touch with and often under the direction of priests, as well as the information gathered through the usual diplomatic channels, it then becomes evident that the Secretariat of the State of the Vatican is one of the best informed news agencies in the world, if not the best. Unquote. Read The Dollar and the Vatican by Avro Manhattan, published 1988. Other Vatican observers draw attention to the moles 
buried deep within the espionage rec networks of the CIA, the KGB, the MI5 and other secret services throughout the world, whose ultimate allegiance may well be determined by a secret oath of loyalty to the papal system. It seems likely that Mossad, the Israeli intelligence service, widely regarded as dollar for dollar far and away the most effective, is the least penetrated in this way. And here I have to say the author Michael de Semlian errs. When you open up the book Vatican Assassins Wounded in the House of My Friend, I have here an edition of 461 pages, that's volume of uh, one of five volumes, and I open up page 60, I have a little uh, hierarchy that starts uh, the world system in 1963, of course, on top is Satan, the god of this world, as we can read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Beneath Satan in this world, then we find at the time the Jesuit general John Baptiste Janssens, and beneath him, of course, is Giovanni Battista Montini, the so-called infallible and Masonic Pope Paul VI. Under him we have in the hierarchy Francis Cardinal Spellman, Archbishop of New York, Knight of Columbus, American U.S. military vicar, and, of course, a Knight of Malta. Beneath him we find J. Peter Grace, Jr., which is very interesting because we will come to him later in this book again. So, remember the name. J. Peter Grace, Jr., member of the Council on Foreign Relations, head of the American branch of the Knights of Malta, head um, W.R. Grace & Co., sponsored Operation Paperclip, where they got all the German Nazi uh, criminals into the United States of America, and of course working also for the military-industrial complex. Beneath him we have John A. McCone, he was a Knight of Malta, working for the military-industrial complex and is director at that moment from the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. Beneath him, and now it comes interesting, and this is why I refute what Michael de Semlian wrote about the Mossad in this book here, comes James Jesus Angleton, who is a Knight of Malta, OSS officer in Rome, NKVD and KGB agent, chief counterintelligence of the CIA, manned the Vatican desk in the CIA, manned the, manned the Israeli desk in the CIA, and blamed Castro and Oswald. And right next to him, are two persons. The one is Kim Philby, who I don't even go into that right now, that's not that interesting, but the other one is very interesting, that is Reinhard Gehlen, a German Knight of Malta, a general in the Knight of Malta organization, Nazi intelligence working, because he was the one, he was the general under Hitler, um, responsible for the uh, counterintelligence uh, in Russia at that time. Yeah? And he builds the CIA together in the time with Wild Bill Donovan, another Knight of Malta, and Reinhard Gehlen then went to train Israel's Mossad. So when Israel's Mossad was trained by a Knight of Malta, Reinhard Gehlen, who together with Wild Bill Donovan erected the CIA out of the OSS. Are you going to tell me that, as the author states here, that the Mossad is the least penetrated in this way? No, they are all penetrated in that way. And all these intelligence agencies all over the world work together. And all their uh, combinations come together in one place in this world. And that is, as the author correctly writes here, in the Secretariat of State of the Vatican. There all roads lead to, from all the secret and the um, intelligence agencies. They all come together in the Secretariat of State. And that, of course, is Jesuit controlled. And the Jesuits are on top of all intelligence agency all over the world. And on the top they know they play together. But, of course, the poor people in the street have no idea. Anyway, continuing in the book on page 118. Paper links with the CIA have been strong since the agency superseded the OSS, Office of Strategic Services, after World War II. 
For example, the Knights of Malta, otherwise known as the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, or short SMOM, which acts and is recognized as a government in itself, get that? It is recognized as a government in itself, it doesn't have a country, doesn't have a people, but it has a, 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 a government in itself and is internationally recognized by that, even by the United Nations, has clear bonds with the CIA. In 1948, the order, which is totally loyal to the Pope, issued one of its most prestigious awards of honor, the Gran Croci al Merito Complacia, to General Richard Gehlen, <laughs> whom was I just talking about? Head of Adolf, Hitler, Adolf Hitler's anti-Soviet spy network. After the war, Galen was hired by the CIA along with other Nazi war criminals. The former head of the Knights of Malta in the USA, J. Peter Grace, uh, who we were just talking about, head of the CFR, American branch of the, and head of the American branch of the Knights of Malta, the industrialist was personally involved in getting Nazis out of Europe and into America and helping to reduce their prison sentences as well as employing them in the giant family organization. Two CIA directors have been Knights of Malta. No, 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 no. 2016, where we are today, one or two maybe have not been, and all the others have been Knights of Malta. Even George H. Bush, the father of George W. Bush, when he was CIA director, he is a Knight of Malta. So the author says two CIA directors have been Knights of Malta. No, 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 no. Many, many more. Every CIA director, according to as far as I know, have been a Knight of Malta. But he goes on to say, namely, um, John and William Casey. And with that, even he forgets the founder, while Bill Donovan, who was a Knight of Malta. And George Rocker, Deputy Chief of Counterintelligence, also held membership, according to writer Kathleen Hayes. Quote, More than adequate information exists to link the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, the ultra-right wing, the Vatican and the CIA to the Iran-Contra affair. Behind what was made to appear as an anti-communist effort in Central America was another plot. Evidence from the, uh, from the hearings clearly indicated that a shadowy government within the United States government was in operation. Exactly what it was attempting to accomplish remains murky. Unquote. We can read that in Knights of Malta uh, Comprise a Shadowy Society from Kathleen R. Hayes, published 1987. Oliver North's attorney for the Iron Contra hearings, Brendan Sullivan, is a Knight of Malta, as is his firm's prestigious proprietor, Bennett Williams, Knight of Malta. The involvement of the Vatican and the Jesuits in Nicaraguan politics is referred to elsewhere in this book. The Times reported in 1987 that former Gestapo chef uh, Chief Klaus Barbie, uh, Klaus Barbie's principal collaborators in German occupied France, Paul Touvier, was shielded by the Church and the Catholic hierarchy of Lyon, and in his deal with the Vatican had handed over all the militia money from the looting of Jewish homes and properties, as we can read in the Times from the 18th of May 1987. Klaus Barbie. It is instructive to note that before his arrest, Barbie, who had been recruited by the CIA after the war, was heavily involved in arms deals as well as in Bolivian politics with Lucio Gelli, Grand Master and other members of the Masonic Lodge Propaganda Due, P2, as we can read in David Yellops in God's Name. Very interesting footnote here that we go back to Lucio Galli, whom I already mentioned a few chapters before, and his Propaganda Due, Masonic Italian Lodge. The Daily Mail recalled that Touvier, going back to the Touvier-Barbie connection here, 
was twice sentenced to death for war crimes, even though he can only die once. But listen, this is getting interesting. First, in 1945, when he disappeared under church protection, and then in 1947. So twice sentenced to death. Under the French Statute of Limitations, these sentences expired in 1967, and five years later, after intensive church lobbying, President Pompidou pardoned him. The Daily Mail columnist Geoffrey Levi went on to point out that the people of Lyon believe, quote, quite simply, that Touvier had been sheltered and helped all these years because of what he knows about the church, unquote. We can read that in the Daily Mail, 14th of July, 1989. The Vatican Papers joins with other accounts of the Nazi monastery escape route managed by a Croatian priest and used by many of the Nazis, including Martin Bormann, attired as a Jesuit priest, and Adolf Eichmann, who escaped to Argentina via uh, with a Vatican passport. This book also exempt uh, uh, this book also examines the close connections between the Vatican and Odessa, the secret organization of former Nazis. The Independent of the 6th of January 1988 records Cardinal Franz König, former Archbishop of Vienna, quoted in the Israeli newspaper Yediot Aronath as saying, and I will go into that within a second. First of all, for the people who have no idea, and have never heard of it, check out the Vatican Red Lines. The Vatican Red Lines, via the Vatican Red Lines, a lot of European Nazi collaborators and Nazi war criminals went via most and for all cloisters, nunneries and monaries, via the Roman Catholic Church help system, uh, were shipped into South America. Uh, first and for all Argentina, but also Brazil, Guatemala and Chile, of course. That was one way to get the guilty German war criminals out of Europe, and the other one was to go for them directly into the United States of America via Operation Paperclip. So now we're going to see what <coughs> Franz König, former Archbishop of Vienna, is quoted in the Israeli newspaper, saying in 1988, quote, after the war, senior churchmen helped Nazi criminals flee. Quote, I personally know two, an Austrian and a German, both hold to this day high posts in the Vatican. Unquote. Cardinal Koenig also stated that the Catholic Church in Austria bore part of the responsibility for Nazi crimes against the Jews. The Holocaust Museum exhibition in Jerusalem begins with a picture and description of the Roman Catholic bishops of Austria at the Anschluss, welcoming Hitler's legions as liberators and bestowing their apostolic blessing on the Nazis. The monastery escape route is also known as the Red Route, or the Vatican Red Lines. An article in Jerusalem Post of December 15, 1990 by Alexander Zvielli described how United States agent Vince, uh, Vincent La Vista discovered in the spring of 1947 that the Vatican and the International Red Cross were the main forces behind the illegal immigration of Nazis from Germany to Latin America via Italy. La Vista reported, quote, further investigation has established that in those Latin American countries where the church is a controlling or dominating factor, the Vatican has brought pressure to bear which has resulted in the foreign missions of those countries taking an attitude almost favoring the entry into their country of former Nazis and former fascists or other political groups, so long as they are anti-communist. The Vatican was of course the largest single organization involved in this illegal immigration. It provided transport, it provided hideout and the Vatican also provided financial support. 
On the other hand, such groups, the Vatican included, did not operate without help. They had necessarily, at various times and under certain conditions, to make use of the International Red Cross. Unquote. And of course, the International Red Cross is a papal organization, is, was and always will be. And this finishes chapter 10 of All Roads Lead to Rome from Michael de Semlian. That was called Vatican Below the Surface. Next time in chapter 11 we go into the papal power and have our fun reading and exposing that part. I hope you find it interesting and I hope you do your own research. As I said, I will provide the link of the video that I watched from the forerunner, the Pope's Silent War, and the document from conflict to uh, communion in the description box of the video. And you can search that for yourself. And also you can get Vatican Assassins for free on the internet and check what I read from there. So, for the moment... Uh, Juggler 66 from Hour of the Truth says God bless you and signing off until next time. Bye bye. We as Bible believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government, and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these. Um, a mercenary companies out in the world, like XE or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many. And so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You, as Bible-believing Christians, already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, take that information in what happens about there, pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of and that they are just deceived people that they maybe have a chance by going through this situation maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way maybe they have a way to find to the real truth I mean these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called quote-unquote Christian countries. Of course the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground, even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians, and that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbor.